I do want to talk about discernment because it's like the number one question of someone who's trying to serve God. It's like, how do I know what is God's will for my life? Yeah, and it's always a tough question. We have in the New Testament this idea that God is seeking to communicate to us, but that we need to have a framework through which we can determine, is that me? That's one source. Is it the demonic? That's another source. Or is it the divine? You have to tune your heart to his voice. Welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. Today we're going to talk about how to discern what God's will is for your life, how to make decisions, and then how to navigate, yes, spiritual and sort of just emotions in decision making. Because I think so much of our life comes down to those pivotal moments of when we choose what career to take, what school to go to, who to marry, if we get married, where to live, all of these big decisions. And for those of us who are people of faith, which is many of people who listen to this podcast, we want that to be, and I think everyone wants that to be the right decision. We hope that it's God's will. So we're really, really blessed today to have on the podcast Dan Burke. He is the author and editor of 17 books, former editor of a national newspaper. He's worked at a lot of great organizations. He founded his own now. He runs the site, his organization, the Avila Institute, runs the site spiritualdirection.com. A lot of fascinating stuff there. But my favorite book that Dan has written that I've read that I love is called Spiritual Warfare and the Discernment of Spirits. I've given this book away to several different people, and it really goes into the heart of decision making and navigating the spiritual life. So we're going to get into that with Dan, and we're also going to hear a little bit about Dan's background, which is really fascinating as well in his personal story. So without further ado, Dan Burke, welcome to the podcast. And Lala, it's great to be with you. I've been an admirer of your work for a long time, and we've crossed paths, I think, once in Napa, maybe. But um, yeah, it's great to be on. We have, we have, I think, a handful of mutual friends and all for the good of the kingdom. So it's, it's a joy to be with you. Thank you. Thanks for making the time. So I want to start with your background and your story. The first few chapters, or it was the first chapter of your spiritual discernment book, I just cried because it was so moving mm. as you shared some of your personal story. But I'd love to hear, I'd love for yeah. people to kind of know where you're coming from as you've gotten to become really an expert in discernment and the spiritual life. Yeah, so I'm Jewish uh, by birth and converted to Catholicism uh, uh, and Christianity some time ago, but um, uh, still Jewish, Hebrew Catholic, I guess. Uh, but we were a nominally religious family, even though that is very much my identity. But my mother dabbled in the, the occult, and sometimes when you call into the darkness, nothing comes, and unfortunately, sometimes something does come, and in our home it did, and it really... Uh, was a terrifying reality. I mean, there was also abuse just on a human level, I'm sure aided by the spiritual. Uh, my stepfather, you know, fired a gun in our home, beat my mother into the emergency room, terrorized us kids. So there was this co combination of occult issues, practices, and really uh, to honor my mom, she was just doing what she, she was just looking for answers. You know, a lot of people do that uh, look into the wrong places when they're suffering. And her mother attempted to kill her father, her, uh, and then she, her mother was institutionalized when she was a teenager. So so my mom ended up being mom as a teenager to other two other siblings. Dad was a barber, you know, World War II vet. So just, you know, she grew up in a tough situation. And then when I was born, my, my older brother uh, didn't make it into this world. And then I was born, and then she had cancer. So just, and I was born very sick, uh, uh, without hearing and, and uh, severe lung disease. And just so, so she's just rattled with life and looks to the occult. So she went to, you know, your, just your typical um, astrologers, palm readers, seance sort of stuff. And something came, and it was, and it, and it, it's, it's, it's extremely difficult to talk about. I've only written and talked about it a very little bit because it's so hard to explain. I mean, it's, it's like stuff out of movies, you know, like the movie Poltergeist, if you remember that one. But it's, 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 it's sort of a, it happened a long time ago. But it's just 
there is a spiritual reality out there and and unfortunately when people call and and it happens it really um creates a a, a profoundly frightening environment especially for a young boy who's living in the midst of all that other chaos and and then dealing with the the demonic uh, element so eventually i became christian uh, Primarily, if you don't mind me asking I mean, before. I, I, I want to. Oh, yeah. I want to hear. Yeah. I want to hear. Obviously, the, the the becoming Christian thing is so incredible. But when you mention, you know, you're this little boy living in this abusive household, your mother is really struggling. It's really tough. And you mentioned, you know, there's this now really a portal to the demonic world that's opened up in your own home, and it was very scary for you. Can you share more about mm -hmm. what that looked like? You know. Um, I don't know. Uh, you used the word portal, which is interesting, because that, that is, in a, in a sense, what it was. Um, you know, I, it's just so difficult, Lila. I, I, it, what you see and experience is like living in a dream, but you're awake, and it's during the daytime, and you're seeing and hearing voices, and you're seeing demonic uh, activity, and you just, like, I had no... I now because I'm involved with exorcism deliverance ministry. I mean, we have an exorcist that works for our organization, um, and I've lived it. You know, from that angle, it's sort of interpreting backwards into what I was seeing as a young boy, and knowing I'm sane, of course, right? Uh, and knowing I was sane then, uh, it's still even difficult. It was just like living. Like, if you think of your nightmares that you have, but I had them in the daytime and and experienced uh, that kind of darkness in while I was awake and uh, and and how to explain it, it it's it's just, you know, I guess I could bring uh, I should probably think of movies and scenes or something. But um, when a demonic entity, is invited in and it does respond and it's allowed to respond or more i don't even know if there were more than more than one their whole modus operandi is to control you and to get you to separate from god and separate from one another and move you to despair and move you into the dark draw you into the darkness so that then you can be manipulated and and that was just my battle as a young as a boy, uh, it, it was just, it was terrifying. I, the scene you referenced, um, well, one of the scenes you referenced was one time during the day, I was seeing and hearing those things, whatever they were, the demonic things, and, and, and you know, I had no emotional capacity to deal with it. It was just terror on a level, you know, you think of on a scale of one to 10, it's off the scale. How and, old were you? And I was um, probably was was before junior high, so you know, probably nine or so, eight nine years old. And so I did something really irrational, which sounds strange, but I just tried to bury myself in the couch and put my head in the couch. And but I was crying off, you know, I was I was just scared out of my wits because you like you can't run to a location to escape that. So, you know, so then when, when my mom got home, you know, she just found me hysterical and, and just uh, proceeded to hit me. And, and I guess, you know, a more, most positive explanation of that is to sort of, you know, you slap somebody out of their, their kind of strange delusion or whatever was going on, but it, it really didn't work out that way. Um, you know, so, yeah, it, it's as close as I can get. I mean, I... I Later on, after I became a Christian, I actually saw uh, demonic entities, um, which I, I don't, probably some of your audience is thinking that's just nuts. Who who claims that? But you know, I know an exorcist who actually can see them, um, which is a, not an, a gift that all exorcists have. Uh, and then, of course, I've seen them manifest in and through people who are possessed. So, so, but I actually saw them in a church setting. And that uh, drove me to get deli deliverance. But that, I'm sort of jumping back and forth. So that's my best attempt um, without, yeah, it, it's, it's just very difficult. 
Well, thank you for sharing. And you had in your book, I remember just to kind of uh, hear a little more about your childhood. There was a scene, as I remember it, in, in your book where you talked about, I think it was, you know, experiencing lovelessness, you know, not feeling wanted or loved. And mm -hmm. I think then you, you write yeah. later on about having that wound healed as an adult, as part of your um, yeah. conversion. So I'd love to hear you share about that as much as you're comfortable, because I, I do think that is um, really powerful and, and really encouraging because many people experience, you know, varying degrees of wounds um, and from their childhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. And I did. I mean, I heard, I heard things, you know, uh, uh, s spoken to me that people who are caring for you shouldn't. And, you know, some kids are more resilient than others. I I'm, I'm a melancholic uh, introvert. And so uh, everything amplifies that enters into my realm, you know, especially when, when you're a little bit less mature as a child. And so, yeah, that, that was difficult. But so growing up in that, brought brought me of course to despair by the time i was 19 18 19 and really came to the conclusion that there if i couldn't find a reason for the suffering because i had left home and, and and realized well leaving home to go away to school didn't solve the problem um it because it, it, it stays with you all those wounds and uh just out of desperation um came to the conclusion that i was either going to put a bullet in my head or find a reason and interpreting backwards because you know through our lens the lens of our faith now it was like the holy spirit said to me well you've seen you you know beyond a shadow of a doubt the spiritual world exists look there it's not just all darkness you know so so that's where i began to look and and started to and i began where my mother's you know bookcase led me initially which was unfortunately in the new age movement and uh a lot of things like edgar casey and uh you know these um so-called prophets and and uh but quickly i realized because uh, i was a voracious reader that the, the rationally all the claims that you know all roads sort of lead to the same place and you know all these great people who have influenced the world spiritually like you know, Buddha or Gandhi or, you know, uh, Lao Tzu or whatever, these these Eastern religions or Jesus, you know, among them as they described him, were, were all to be revered and they all just, you should just lean in and figure out which one works best for you. Just was, you know, profoundly irrational to me because if you go an inch deep into any of the major religions, their claims about who we are as human humans who is God or, or the, any conceptions of gods, um, what it means to be uh, in, in a kind of a pathway to salvation, whatever that looks like, if it's nirvana or, or just, or, or mindfulness or, you know, or total detachment, whatever the, they were, they're all different. And so I'm looking at it thinking, well, this is sort of a, a ridiculous potpourri of ideas that people try to manufacture into some kind of commonality and I, it just didn't seem true and so uh in that process of course i stumbled into the claims of jesus and um uh you know ex and, and ultimately came to believe in those i can share more about that journey in detail but uh, i want i want to go wherever you want to go mm -hmm. Hey guys, so I want to tell you about a new podcast sponsor today that I am excited about. This is an app that is free for anyone to download. It's called the Amen app. The Amen app is produced by the Augustine Institute and it's a prayer app. It's got a great simple interface and it's something that I've actually been using over the last two years because it's so simple and easy to use. What do you get when you use the Amen app? Well, you download it and what I do is I listen to the daily readings. So scripture readings every day, Old Testament, New Testament, the Psalm for the day, the Gospels of the day. You can also listen to the Rosary on the app and pray the Rosary. You can listen to sleep stories. There's some kids content on there. So there's all kinds of spiritual content. It's free, it's easy to use, it's simple, and it can be a great part of your daily routine, especially if you've got a commute and you drive or you're doing dishes, you can put in your headphones. It's a great way to just reconnect with God and to pray prayers. So check out the Amen app today. Again, it's free. You can download it in the app store. I think you're going to enjoy it and join me and many others on the app who are praying with it every day to deepen their walk with God. Well, uh, and you have 
shared in different books and obviously you're speaking and stuff that there's many steps on your journey for folks listening you know you you're catholic you were i think evangelical you mentioned before that new age give us the cliff notes on you know that progression because i think the bottom line there is you have experienced a lot of spirituality and you understand i think the spirituality of a lot of different kinds of christians yeah so um when I came to that point of despair and, and that just, you know, it was essentially a crying out to God it occurred in that context. I mean, I remember I was on the corner of Thunderbird and 19th Street in Phoenix, Arizona, at the apartments where, where I lived and, and just said, Lord uh, or God, if you're there, whatever I said, you've got to help me because I am I'm dying and I, I, I need answers and can't, can't can't live with this, you know, drinking myself to sleep at that time or trying. It actually doesn't work in case anybody is wondering. Um, and, uh, and he began to send people into my life to bear witness to me of his existence. And, and one of them was a, a evangelical Christian. He was, uh, played a 12 string guitar, um, worked with me at pizza hut, uh, when I was going to school there. And, uh, he was a special guy. I mean, he had a real conversion. He was a cocaine addict prior, and he told me, it's, you know, shared with me, uh, ultimately, he, he ultimately befriended me, which was not a good, easy thing to do, because at that time, I was still in this phase of people hurt really bad, and so the best thing to do with people is to keep a distance, and so as you would imagine, my affect was uh, uh, sufficiently defensive and, and not friendly, but the love of Christ in him really uh, helped him to overcome whatever, you know, my, uh, my issues were. And, he, you know, he would get his work done and help me. And initially, uh, well, the funny part was I, I thought he was hitting on me because I, I couldn't figure out a reason anyone would be nice to me in general. Um, and, and for, like for no reason, right? There was an, I didn't have anything to offer him. So I took him out back and threatened his life. And, and he told me, that um, at least I, mean, I, 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 of course, wouldn't do that sort of thing today, but that's where I was then. And I just, he just said, well, look, I'm a Christian. I, I, this is, we're supposed to be nice. And I, you know, he, 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 he was pretty excited uh, and had his hands up like in a defensive posture that I don't remember exactly what I said to him, but he so said, you, no, so I'm a you Christian. actually threatened nice. his life. <laughs> you were, you were a tough yes, guy. I did. Yet, so you, I, I did. So you, had you done that to someone before? I mean, is that was uh, that like a you thing? know I grew up I grew up in a pretty tough situation I had never I I and I did have an anger problem and I had yeah I had I had done things that were stupid like that so that was not outside of my uh my my normal behavior unfortunately but thankfully you know he said look I'm a, this we're supposed to be nice I remember him saying that which was kind of funny in retrospect um and uh and then he told me about it sort of morphed into you know him sharing his motivation which was look i'm just you know <laughs> i've been saved by grace i the lord has helped me and i'm that's what i'm about and i'd love to tell you about it and uh it another funny moment was he he said he said you know he saw me responding well i sort of calmed down and and uh, he, so eventually he invited me to like do a Bible study with him. And uh, it gives you a little more picture of where my head is at. I, you know, he says, so I said, well, what is that like? And he said, well, we get together and we read the Bible and we talk about our, our feelings about it. And I'm like, wow, that is really gay. There is no way I'm doing that with a dude, you know? I said, I, so I said, look, if you want to go out in the desert shooting or you want to go do something, you know, I'm cool with that, but I am not sitting around with some other dude talking about my feelings and the Bible. And <laughs> so, you know, God be praised. You know, he 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 became a friend, and and he was a he was a comfort to me. Um, tried to take me to church, but given what I was giving off, I think I don't really know. I don't know what I was like to other people, but. When I, when I went one time, I was like in and out because I got, I remember it, it sort of reminds me of, of a guy I met at my parish one time who had a ball, it was bald. 
He had a goatee, huge tattoos, dressed like a biker. He looked very dangerous, and I saw him going up for communion. And I thought, yeah, I, he looked like a skinhead. Well, I later discovered he worked for the, uh, he worked for um, uh, ATF, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and he, and he, and he impersonated skin and infiltrated skinhead gang. So he looked really uncomfortable to be around. And, and I, so I'm thinking probably something like that happened to me in the church I went to, because people were looking at me like, at least it felt like they were looking at me like, what are you doing here? Why, you know, you don't belong here. And so I left even before like figuring out what Christians do in a service, you know? Um, so, uh, but he had a lasting effect on me as, mm. as did a number of others that God sent my way. But eventually you know, I started listening to evangelical radio because he was one of those, and it was interesting to me. Moved back to California and uh, listened to uh, one guy, Bible Answer Man, on evangelical radio, who I really liked because he's kind of a jerk, and he he sort of he thought and ta talked like me, but without certain language, and <laughs> in the sense that he was very honest about his views. And he would say, this is what this scripture passage says, and this is what these three schools think of it, and this is my view. And I just liked his, you know, the way, I, I just felt like he was very direct and clear. So he, he let it slip, he was a Southern Baptist. So I decided, well, what the heck? I mean, I guess they're all good. Southern Baptists are good, because I didn't know anything. So I just looked in the white pages. I don't know if you're, you even know what that is, given your age, but... Uh, it's, 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 it used to be a huge book that had all the addresses and name, you know, it's like what we have on the internet now. And I triangulated the closest Southern Baptist church. And, um, I went and sat in the back on the left-hand side to be incognito. Cause I had no clue what happened in a Christian service. I'd been in synagogue when I was a kid, uh, but I didn't know there was any relationship, you know, similarities between the two. So sat in the back. And then, unfortunately, well, fortunately for me, this was a front row back Baptist church, not a back row Baptist church. So in this case, the five five pews across the whole front filled up. Somehow, the pastor had convinced people to do that. Then there's about 20 empty pews and me all incognito, uh, hiding out just and all by myself as glaring as a you know, sore thumb. And so the pastor saw that and he pounced on me after the service and he said what are you gonna this is a great question by the way that every that protestants ask that every catholic should ask and know but he said what are you going to do when god when you get to your judgment and god asks why i should let you in wow what are you going to say <laughs> and I, yeah and i said uh i'll just tell you exactly what i said so forgive me for the spicy language but I said, I don't know what the hell you're talking about, but I said, I'm dying inside. Hmm. And I said, but if you have answers and you think you can help me, then I will listen. And so it's, 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 it's funny how the emotion never goes away. So, uh, by God's mercy, this guy was serious, you know, and so my, me and my cousin were living together, we were working construction for my dad's company, and so he said, well, I can come over to your, and walk, 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 and answer all your questions, so he did for a year, every Thursday night, me and Mike and, and uh, Pastor Les was his name, we went through Evidence Demands a Verdict, which is a, which was the perfect book for me, it's it's a a look at the evidences for the veracity of scripture old and new testaments based on a legal standard of uh, beyond a reasonable doubt and so we looked at the archaeology the internal consistency the um the claims of the authors you know all of these different uh aspects you know comparing you know the veracity of scripture with other ancient texts that are accepted um, uh, to various levels like Plato and Aristotle and that sort of thing. And, and eventually, I was convinced that the Bible at least was a reliable document historically. At least the Old Testament was. And in particular, 
uh, the the Dead Sea Scrolls played a big role in that, and and eventually in my conversion. But uh, then then he said, well, let's look at the prophecies of the Messiah of the Old Testament. So, for for instance, in Isaiah, to whom he would be born, um, or in the Psalms, uh, where he would be born, how he would be killed, uh, all of these different aspects, and then comparing it to Jesus in the New Testament. And of course, you know, there's just nobody who really looks at all of that with uh, open an open mind can walk away going, yeah, there's. I don't know how anyone would conclude based on just a rational examination of the evidence that that the, the New Testament is true, that Jesus is who he claimed to be beyond a reasonable doubt. I just don't know how I couldn't escape the conclusion. I mean, C.S. Lewis helped me kind of put a, a final nail in that coffin, and I'll, I'll pause here once I tell you this so you can steer me in where you want to go, but... Lou, I read Mere Christianity, and he he postulated that Jesus is either a lunatic because he believes he's God, and he know you know, and he's not. He's a liar because he's he knows he's not, but he's he's falsely claiming to be so. Or he is who he said he was. And I will add, when he said to the to the lead, you know the Jewish leaders at the time before Abraham was, I am, which caused them to tear their clothes and cry out blasphemy because he was claiming to be pre-exist um, their fathers, you know, Abraham, and and he claimed to be uh, that I am who I am, which was God meeting Moses in the burning bush. And of course they knew there's no more powerful way to claim to be God. And so at that point, I just said, okay, I'm, you are God. I'm not, please help me, rescue me, set me free. I, I'm, I'm lost and I need to be found. And you know, you you borne witness to me, and these people you sent to me, I believe. And so, uh, I was baptized in Glen Memorial Baptist Church in Covina, California, uh, a long time ago. It's a new year, so it's time for some new meat. Time to check out GoodRanchers.com, which is American meat delivered. You've heard me talk about it before, and this is American sourced from American ranchers meat that is delicious. It's seafood, poultry, pork, meat, chicken, all the things you could ever want, and you can get it delivered right to your door. So go to GoodRanchers.com today. They've got some great specials. In fact, they have a special where you get free annual supply of chicken. You get two pounds of chicken every single month. You can use the code Lila at checkout for this. Guess what? The chicken is my favorite of all their things. Their steaks are delicious. So if you're into steak, if you're doing the carnivore diet or whatever you're doing, you will love their steak. But their chicken is my personal favorite. My husband Joe and I love the Good Ranchers chicken. We can always tell when we eat it. We try to only eat it now and you're going to love it too. So go to GoodRanchers.com today. This is a pro-life, pro-family company, by the way. The owners are amazing. They're a great team over there. We're actually going to have them on the podcast in the future. You're going to love GoodRanchers.com and you can get $20 off and two pounds of free chicken every single month when you use the code Lila at checkout and you sign up today. So go to GoodRanchers.com and enjoy your American meat delivered. What's so awesome about your story, Dan, I know there's so much more to it. Uh, we could just do the whole episode on your story and there's so many elements to it. But, you know, you were you've been in so many um, difficult places, you know, as a kid and then you know, as a young adult, like even feeling suicidal, like you said earlier, and, you know, you, you like when you hit rock bottom, you know, and then you rise up and you, you know, you came to the faith. Now you're obviously doing this incredible mission work that you're doing now. I don't know, just everything that you say, I, when I read it anyways, I know other people I, I talk to about your work. It's just, you, you feel that empathy and that understanding because you've been there, you've walked it. Um, so, you know, I, there's so much I want to talk to you about. I'm like, ah, there, we need like three hours. We're going to have to maybe do this again. But I do want to yeah, kind of too. talk about the discernment and stuff because um, that, I think, is on so many people's minds. And yeah. we have a lot of folks who listen to the podcast who are actively making decisions about their life. And it's always a question, how do I, how do I know what is God's will? So I want to start with that. You know, you've become yeah. a Christian you eventually enter the Catholic Church. You were baptized Baptist, then you become Catholic. So you've been on all sides, um, yeah. and you know you, you get this question. I know you run a spiritual direction dot com, but it's like the mm -hmm. number one question of someone who's trying to serve God. It's like, what? How do I know what is God's will for my life in the decisions that I'm making? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and it's always a tough question, you know, because uh, we do, uh, by God's mercy, have this promise from Jesus himself where he says, uh, I think it's in John 14, you know, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. Um, so uh, he also says in John 14 that uh, when we live in this, uh, this is my, this is what I would call a translation. So I'm summarizing: when we live in this, in this covenant of love with Him, which means that we live according to the covenant, that uh, He will manifest Himself to us, and and He and the Father will come and abide with us. So He's promising this self-revelation. He's promising that. His voice is discernible, and we can hear it. So, how do we hear it? And and um, if we were to ask, you know, one of the greatest spiritual masters that's ever lived, Saint John of the Cross, who's uh, heralded as a mystic by you know the folks, one of the greatest poets of the Spanish uh, world, uh, whether or not even people are religious, he's he's revered. And his answer to the question is. To, to know his voice, you got to get to know him. So he would say to to study him, emulate him, love him. And it's similar to a relationship, you know, uh, we're, we're both married. How do you know your spouse? How do you know who they really are? Like, what are they, what are they, um, and, and how do you really truly know what means the most to them? And what do they mean by what they say to us, you know? Um, it can be a challenge, and the way you know is to spend time with them. Fundamentally, the the most important secret to knowing the Word of God, uh, knowing uh, Jesus, knowing God, is spending time with Him in prayer, and and reading His words and, and meditating on His words uh, and on His life, so that you can you can discern when you hear things which Scripture reveals you you will. Um, is this God talking or not, or is it me, you know? So the the voices in my head is often where we get to, where we're praying in silence and we hear, oh, you know, you should do this thing or that thing or think about this or that. People say, well, we, how do I know if it's God's voice or my voice? Well, the answer is you, you have to tune your heart to his voice, right? Um, I think foundationally it's also important to know what is revealed in the New Testament with, you know, like in 1 Timothy 14, um, St. Paul talks about deceiving spirits uh, in his work in 2 Corinthians. He talks about the devil masquerading as an angel of light. In Thessalonians, he says, test all things, hold fast to that which is true. And then we have the Apostle John in his epistle, uh, first, one, first epistle, he says, don't believe every spirit. So, we have in the New Testament this idea that God is seeking to communicate to us, but that we need to have a framework through which we can determine, is that me? That's one source. Is it the demonic? That's another source. Or is it the divine, which is another source? And the New Testament is very clear that we have we can hear, but we have to, we have to dis discern which is which. Okay, so how do you discern which is which? You're praying or you're you know, you're just kind of like driving in your car and you have this thought or inspiration. Maybe it's something like yeah. kind of scary or negative sounding. Uh, it's like a warning, like you're mm -hmm. gonna crash your car. This has happened to me before, by the way, yeah. and I didn't crash my car and it was more like my imagination because okay. I'm very imaginative. But you know, there's people who said, <clears throat> oh, a guardian angel, you know, God told me I was going to crash my car. And so I had, I moved lanes and it saved my life, you know? So <laughs> yeah. um, what, what are some of the ground rules for discerning voices or ideas yeah. that come well, to one's mind? I think a good, yeah, a good shortcut, uh, which those are always good in this context, but a good shortcut is, is, is the, when you look at the fruits of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, which are love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. So when you hear a voice, if, if what does it convey to you fundamentally? Uh, does it convey those things? So, but, but there's a qualifier. So let me back up and say the way that the good spirits and the, the language of the New Testament is also carried out through the followers of Jesus in and outside of the Catholic Church. But what I'm going to shift to is, is Ignatius 
of Loyola, who really became probably the, the most widely known uh, disciple of Jesus in the Catholic realm because he helped us to understand how to live what the New Testament reveals, right? So he's, he, he discovered through his uh, prayer and, and helping people in the faith that there were two kinds of people and, and that the good spirits and the bad spirits communicated two kinds of ways to those two kinds of people. So the first set of people are people who go, are going from mortal sin to mortal sin. And for Protestants or evangelicals who are listening, he gets that language from the epistles of John you know, sin unto death or not. John distinguishes between sin unto death or other kinds of sin. So in the Catholic realm, that's called mortal or venial sin. That's how we categorize those. And so he he, deter, he, he reveals that when somebody's going from mortal sin to mortal sin, meaning very serious sin to very serious sin, and over and over, so let's say it's adultery, just as in, it's, or porn, it's the, you know, those are the easiest ones. Uh, the most, uh, they plague most young people today. When you're in those contexts, the the bad spirit will try to entice you with ideas and um, feelings that mimic peace related to doing the sin again. So this, so you, so essentially, they try to give you this false peace about the sin. Now, you might say, well, how does that work with porn? Maybe a better example is. Uh, two young people living together who aren't married. And so what is what happens in the context of that relationship? Well, there are, there are sexual things that happen. There's relational things that happen that, may, that give each person some manner, measure of comfort on a temporal level that fills the memory and that affects the emotions. And so the bad spirit will play on that and, and try to elicit this do this again, stay committed in this relationship. You, you don't need to worry about marriage. Isn't it, doesn't it feel good? Don't you remember this instance and how it made you feel good? And so it gives you this false peace. And then the, the good spirits, this is God working, is constantly saying to you, you know, she, so we say, might say to the man, she's not your wife. You know, you were brought up in a Christian home. You know what's right. And, she, and you don't know that She's not somebody else's wife. And by the way, she's she's a daughter of the king. I made her for a different kind of life, and you are perpetuating this, and you're taking advantage of her, and you won't, you know, you're not committing to her to marry her. So the, so the bad, the good spirit is making you feel bad. <laughs> he's, he's pricking and biting your conscience. He's making you uncomfortable. So this kind of blows up a, a common myth that is really often unfortunately uh, 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 given to people or bad advice, which is, if you feel peace, it's God's will. No, no, no. It might be, but that, but that has to be discerned within a broader context. So if somebody came to me and said, well, I feel peace because though we're not married, you know, I love her and she loves me and I feel it all feels great. And I feel, you know, it, I feel like we don't need a marriage contract. Well, you know, <laughs> If, if I, it, you know, it, it's easy to discern that person's being deceived by the bad spirit. And I could easily ask them questions to, to reveal why. And my, I would ask them a question like, well, do you ever feel guilty? And if they're honest, they're going to say, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me about how often, how long does your peace last? And they would tell me it doesn't last very long. I have to be back with the person, which you see there's this dependent relationship that's unhealthy. And so it's easy to discern, okay, they're in the first rule, which is Ignatius said that where the, the bad spirit brings a false peace, the good spirit pricks and bites the conscience to bring discomfort. So that's that's one scenario. So I'll, I'll quickly give you the second category of people, and then you can take this where you like. The second category of people are people going intensely from good to better. These are people who have said, you know, I know, I know what's right. I may not be in the best place now, but I'm going to run after God now, and I'm going to give my life to him. And whatever he says, I'm going to define as good or bad. And and then the then the then the behavior shifts. So then the bad spirit in that person is going to try to dissuade them through um, what is called desolation, 
which is this the pressing in and darkness that brings about doubt despair and narcissism just it, you know darkness of soul there's many ways that ignatius you know described this that i could give you but and then the good spirit's going to say no but you're making the right decision the good is is in on god's path and you should do that and i'll i have a curiosity can i ask you a question oh yeah about of your course. discernment Go so for it. when you were doing uh when you were doing investigative work to reveal the craziness going on in the the abortion industry did you ever feel as you were moving into it um though you were deeply convicted about the rightness of what you were doing mm -hmm. a kind of oppression and darkness that tried to dissuade you from doing that good that you were doing did you ever experience that yeah i mean there is definitely kind of like a heart sickness level uh to a lot of it because it just felt very dark mm -hmm. i did feel very yeah. confident that it was the right thing to do at the time because there were right. some folks who came along my way that said you know it's immoral to represent yourself as someone you're not in this context but i never felt a guilt or shame or like on a spiritual level a question that i was doing something immoral in that sense it was certainly like oppressive um and dark and yeah. I didn't enjoy yeah. it, you know, uh, but yeah. it was, you know, it was a, it felt that I was doing the right thing for the sake of, you know, trying to follow God, obviously, and then trying to help people that were in danger. Yes, yeah, so I'm, a, I was 100% certain of what you were going to answer and, and, and you did. And the re reason is, is because you were a person going from good to better. You're living a life of faith. And the and though convicted about a good thing, the enemy wants to dissuade you, and so he's going to press in as much of that darkness as he can to try to dissuade you. And that's just you can ask just about any priest who's ever been, you know, willing to share what happened before their ordination, you know, all or maybe even when you decided to start this podcast, you know, uh, which is also a good thing. Like, did you be like, well, can I really do this? And the enemy's, you know, probably saying, you know, who are you to do this? And who wants to listen so to you true. or whatever? You or know? when we get, when I got married, yeah. because like the podcast, getting married, obviously those are two different kinds of things. The getting married is like so vocational, but this is vocational work too. But there was, there's, and then there's the temptation to like self-absorption. Like, well, I don't like how I how it appears and putting yourself out there is so uncomfortable and you get the, you get all wrapped up in like yourself, right? And you're like, that's not why I'm doing this. Like, yeah. you know, it's it's okay if you don't look perfect. It's okay if you mess up because you're doing this for, you know, Dan Burke being on your show to talk about this stuff and, you know, bring these things up again and again. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you worry about the impact and this and that, but it's like, that doesn't matter. You're, you're doing a faithful thing. You're trying to be faithful with it. Um, and I remember getting married too. Like there were a lot of curveballs. Uh, that just kind of shook your sort of um, emotional, psychological level of like, is this, you know, I, I don't want, we don't have to get in all the gory details, but like the wet feet syndrome of like this decision and these yeah. imaginations of other things. But then at the core, it was the piece of like, no, this is something not irresistible because I, I mean, I was deeply in love with my husband, but it was like this very core feeling of, um, I want to do this at a very deep level. I feel that God is with me in this even though there's turbulence at this like on this like more superficial level on the the deepest level there is a anchor and that's you know where you stay the course so let's dissect it a little bit in terms of now we're in a spiritual direction session which is great <laughs> <laughs> but it's good it's good it's it's good to help people like get the real thing so mm -hmm. what what was going on with you so in in second corinthians 10 it says that though we we live in the world we not we're not we're not carrying on a worldly war so we're in a war and then he says the weapons of our warfare are not worldly but have divine power so we're in a war, we have weapons, we have divine power to destroy strongholds. What are those? Um, we just, he goes on to say, we destroy arguments and every proud op obstacle to the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So what's, what's going on in these moments? Well, there's a war <laughs> and the war is between you and the enemy of God who hates you because God loves you. Um, and he wants to wreck you to get back at God, right? And so he doesn't want you to do anything that advances your uh, your your calling, 
um, your ultimate fulfillment in him and all of that. So you're, whether you're heading toward marriage or a podcast or any major decision, if you're going from good to better, the enemy is going to try to get you into the realm of doubt, despair, and narcissism. Any, any, any form of those three, which are the opposites of faith, hope, and love. Some people think the opposite of love is hate, but it's really, it's narcissism because love is meant to be given to the other. And it's, when it's turned on itself, it, it becomes narcissistic. So, so it, you know, you described doubt, um, not doubt of your love for your husband, but just as kind of a pro it was probably a very vague notion that caused anxiety or maybe that about the podcast or, or, or how you appear or, you know, all of these sorts of things that's for someone going to good to better, the enemy is, is going to always look to, sow those, those, uh, elements of discontent. So Ignatius uses words like disturbed, disquieted, agitated, tempted, unconfident, hopeless, lazily, tepid, sab sad alone, and separated. Those are the words that he uses. And of course, all of the synonyms of those words, they all roll up to doubt, despair, and narcissism. What is the good spirit looking to do to you in those moments? To say to you, no, Lila, you know, I, I, I'm sure you heard something like this. Lila, look at what the Lord has already done with you. And, and if you can achieve this, like a podcast is going to be easy. You know, you fought these battles, you're going to be fine. Or Lila, like when I wrote my last, well, not my last book time, book before last was Devil in the Castle. Um, the voice was, was, you know, I know you don't like writing, but because I don't, but l imagine how many people are going to be impacted and 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 really brought to freedom when they understand the great wisdom of Teresa of Avila and the progress of the soul. And think about those, you know, the effect of all your other books, you know, uh, all my books sell very well, you know. So the good spirit is saying, you know, look, look to God's plan, God's fruit in you, and I'm going to be with you and the Lord's going to help you. And so, but we have to do what that passage says in Corinthians. It's we have divine power. We have we we have to become aware of our thoughts, and then we have to decide what to do about it. And we either embrace the thought, which means we we allow it to influence us, or we reject it. And in your case, with your marriage and with your podcast, you you rejected the 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 negative of the enemy and embrace the good that God was presenting before you. And then you, you fought through and, and you carried out with his will and the fruits of both are, I have no doubt evident. I mean, I see you all over YouTube whenever I'm searching for this or that you're popping up. So you're making a difference. You're in the algorithm, you know, so it's evidence of God's, God's blessing. So that, that's how, that's how you learn the voice of God. And, and I think fundamentally, a, a basic idea that we need to understand is, from a negative standpoint, many of the thoughts in our heads are not or, ours and we shouldn't listen to them. And that's usually very revolutionary for people because, and, and, and more so for men, women than men, by the way, because women so more closely identify with their emotions than guys. Guys are, tend to have to learn to connect with their emotions. Women are wired by God to be more receptive and naturally uh, connected to their emotions. So women typically, when they think, I, I think, I feel, I think I perceive, I feel I am, is, a, is one, uh, one thing. And so it, that's, the, that's a real tough thing. Guys do it too, but it's just, you know, guy, what I have to do with men usually is to make them more aware of actually what they're feeling back that into their thoughts and then connect those two for them and then have them realize they're being manipulated. Mm -hmm. But women, it's more of a, 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 I think I feel I am is one thing and, and saying, well, actually, no, I think may not even be I, it may not be that you may not be the source. And then I feel should be disconnected from, I think, because you're being manipulated, you know? So just, uh, uh, and it's an interesting dynamic between men and women, but I think that's why uh, you know Eve was was of course tempted first because she women are designed to be receptive, and uh, and uh, of course 
Adam uh, abdicated his leadership role and stood there while she's talking to this weird creature that doesn't couldn't have looked all that good, you know. But um, anyway, that that's discernment of spirits. And the more you practice that awareness, and the more you learn the rules of discernment that Ignatius gives us in Scripture reveals, then you become really good at distinguishing where this is coming from or not coming from. Are you a coffee lover like me? When you wake up, you need to have your cup of coffee. That's me. And in my first trimester of pregnancy, that wasn't me, but it is now 100% me. And you've got to try, if you haven't already, Seven Weeks Coffee. Seven Weeks Coffee is amazing, delicious, gourmet coffee. It's ethically sourced. It's low acid. You're going to find these amazing blends. And the coolest thing about Seven Weeks Coffee, besides it being an unparalleled cup of coffee for you, is that this is a pro-life coffee company that gives 10% of all of its proceeds, not just its profit, directly to pro-life pregnancy centers that serve moms and babies. So what are you thinking if you're getting your coffee off of the shelf from some brand that is not pro-life? Instead, you can go to sevenweekscoffee.com. You can sign up for the Heartbeat Club where you actually get your coffee sent to you every month. How convenient, these delicious batches. And you are supporting every time you order that coffee, you are supporting the pro-life movement and helping save lives. So go to sevenweekscoffee.com today. If you haven't done this already and you listen to this podcast, what are you waiting for? That's sevenweekscoffee.com. And you can use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. That's sevenweekscoffee.com. Don't forget the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. So what about, I have so many questions, um, what about the scenario, the, and this is a common scenario, where there's two good options or there's multiple good options? Yeah. And, you know, you yeah. would like, and I, this has been a, my experience in life, that there's only one decision that's the best and God's will, and I need to know what it is. And I, you, you can get paralyzed because you've got these multiple, you know, you're, it's schools you're going to go to to yeah. tend to college maybe, you know, or different job offers. Yeah. And you don't have peace fully about maybe any of them. You know, you have doubts about all of them. Maybe some look better than the other. Um, one wise spiritual guide told me once, you know, uh, discernment is thinking, thinking under the light of grace, you know, using your reason yeah. under the light of grace. And that, you know, God um, doesn't like punish us for choosing one of two good options if there's no sin involved and we're doing our best and he has a plan no matter what. But I'm the type who's like, I want to do the one life that God wants me to live. Like I want the maximally holy, fruitful life to get as many souls as possible to heaven. And so, you know, when you're in that zone, you're like is super zealous and every decision it's like, is this God's will? What's the right approach there? Yeah. Well, you've already given good hints, you know, we're people of faith and reason, right? So mm -hmm. God gives us an intellect and a free will and expects us to use them. Um, so uh, the beginning point is, is, uh, should always be, what is the truth? What is God's, what has God already revealed? So the, if we're Catholics and Protestants, um, I can say this, uh, both the highest form of public revelation is scripture, mm -hmm. which, and, and, it, and for and pro, a lot of Protestants maybe not know this, but the, the Catholic Church teaches that nothing can supersede that. So it, it is it is the the most sacred deposit we have of the revelation of God himself and his will and his word. So the first thing is, you know, does what I'm, does either one of the options, well, let me just say first this, you got to get it out of your head because uh, the, the mush of the decision-making process and the related emotions uh, can cause uh, uh, distortions in our perception. So it's really good to just do, you know, side by side pros and cons, get it out of your head onto paper, right? So then the first question is, how does it comport with, with the highest form of revelation that we revere? And is it in contradiction to any of that? So then that's, that solves a lot of problems. The next is, what is your state in life? So we're, you and I are, you know, both married. And so if one option in some way compromises my state um, to some degree and another doesn't, that's easy. I can't do the one that compromises my, my, my state or my vocation in life. So those are some easy uh, qualifiers. And then another, and, and then, but let's say they're equally beneficial. You know, we get down to that and like we, so I live on 64 acres of retreat center. Our Lady of Mount Carmel Retreat Center, it's the home of the Avila Foundation, the Avila Institute. 
and also the Apostle VA community, but we have a discernment house where guys will come who are asking the question, am I supposed to be married? Am I supposed to be a priest? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I tell the guys, you know, because married life is good and priestly life is good. So one of the things I tell them as they're discerning is, I want you to spend some time imagining both. So imagine in your head, what is a good holy Catholic marriage look like? What is it like to be with a holy woman and have children and, and all the good and the difficult? What's it like to change a full, full diaper? And what's it like, you know, when your kid gets sick and what's it like when they get in a fight at school? You know, just sort of what's it like to get in a fight with your spouse? You know, so imagine all the good and the normal things related to that. And now let's imagine, let's say, diocesan priesthood. What is that like to the best of your knowledge? And maybe in both cases, they need to go explore and see. Mm -hmm. So so let's go spend with Father Jones. Let's look, go, let's go look at where he lives and let's well, let's follow him for a day. So so we get this holy imagination. And then I want you to, before the Blessed Sacrament, imagine those, and then I want you to tell me what are the movements in your soul mm -hmm. as you imagine those things. And so if you're moved to faith, hope, and love as you're imagining these things, maybe that's the one. If you're moved to kind of, well, this this isn't really there for me, it's not moving me that direction, well, maybe it's not for you. Um, so that's another Ignatian kind of approach mm -hmm. where you're using your intellect, you're, you're kind of cataloging the differences, they're both good, and then you're trying as best you can to put yourself into those realities and seeing where God leads you. Does it bring you to consolation or does it bring you to desolation? We have a, we have a guy here who was just about to be ordained a deacon um, in a diocesan uh, seminary at a Mundelein in Chicago. And, in, and he's doing that and he's going, I am not called to be uh, in diocesan life. I just, there's nothing about it that is compelling to me. The priesthood is compelling to me. Religious life is compelling to me because he's called to a deep life of prayer. But in that process of just, you know, it just became super clear and he, and he had to exit seminary before he was ordained because he realized then he's in the diocesan system and it's not what he's called to be. So those are ways that we can use uh, the imagination and the trusting God to convey to us uh, in that seeking in the pros and cons and using our intellect and asking for his intervention that he, he's not going to allow he's not going to lead us down a path that's going to be a path to destruction he you know he's trustworthy so that's an example what if you've got like a blind spot or a wound you use the example of the you know the men, the men deciding do you i feel more drawn to marriage when i imagine what it really is like versus like diocesan priesthood and like, what if you, you know, grew up in a broken home, you witnessed an abusive marriage, so you just, you're, you have this ambivalence or these, you know, wounds about marriage or, you know, God forbid on the priesthood side, like you were abused by a priest or you had some horrible experience with yeah. religious people. Um, so how does one navigate that? And even maybe they don't even know, maybe it's so subconscious. Those... They don't even know they have that. Yeah, I mean, those are complicating factors. It, whenever you're deciding big things like this, it, really, you should have a spiritual director or a spiritual guide where, you know, where you're, you've got an objective outside observer who has been trained in how to help people make these decisions. And they would know, I mean, they would know to ask the very questions that you ask. So, you know, like for me, I, my conception of marriage um, was, was 100% negative. Uh, my, both my parents were married. And divorced three times so it was and it was all you know chaotic and, and painful but uh, even so um you know when i would when i when i was became catholic i was single and i and i had i had been in seminary i was an anglican seminarian when i converted and so i when i came into the faith but by that time you know i'm older and and i and I had come to discover, I, I, I obviously knew that I grew up in a really bad situation. I was very aware of all of that, been a Christian for a long time. And um, so I did get a spiritual director, but I, I, I had a conception of what holy marriage could be and what holy religious life could be, which is what I was discerning. And I knew I, knew I needed a particular kind of woman 
um, based on my own background. You know, I knew I needed a very strong woman and very intelligent. I needed a woman who was totally sold out for Jesus. You know, I, I, it, it's it's funny because, so I became Catholic. I exited out of my Anglican seminary, kind of, my bishop didn't know I was going to RCIA. So you went um, New Age, Baptist, Anglican, and then Catholic. <laughs> Right, right, right. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it, the Lord knew what I needed. But um, it was essentially as a Protestant, I was reading back in history. And so I was, mm. I became convinced of apostolic succession. It's a long story. But um, so, uh, yeah, so I, but so I had an altar from when I was in seminary where I would pray the Book of Common Prayer, which we call our version of that as a breviary or, or a, uh, a divine office in the Catholic Church. So as soon as I became Catholic, I got a hold of the Catholic and version and began to pray that every day. And so I had an altar there. And and as I discerned religious life and realized, no, I'm pretty probably pretty wired to be married. I need somebody more. I need to be accountable. I need to be molded. I need I need a woman. I need the the only kind of the healing that a woman can bring. And the kind you know I just knew I. I was too deficient psychologically, spiritually, to be healthy in a, a religious life by myself. So, so I, then I thought, well, marriage is once you get once, you know, a real marriage is one time. And so I thought, well, if I could find a woman that will sit next to me here in this prayer and pray with me every day, where Jesus is the center, we're going to be good. So. I went to Hobby Lobby. I had a bench, you know, where I sat on. I got the exact same bench, and I moved mine to the left. And I'm not kidding you. This I know it sounds a little corny, but it's what I did. And I put a seat next to me so that now, you know, there's a focal point of Jesus, the icon of Jesus on my altar. And I and I actually printed out a reserve sign, and I put it on the bench next to me for the woman that God would bring that would would make Jesus the center and who would pray with me at that altar. And uh, God be praised, he brought me an amazing woman. And I, it, and I was, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just been really beautiful. But that's, that was my discernment process, was eventually I knew I was deficient based on the things that you described. And I knew, uh, I, I, into, you know, reason and faith that I probably wouldn't, I, would be, I needed more form. I needed more human formation that I couldn't get in a, in a kind of religious context, and I would probably get lost, you know, mm -hmm. uh, emotionally, psychologically. And so, then, well, then who? Well, the who has got to be a woman who sold out for Jesus, who it like, you know, because I'm so messed up. I'm mean, to be really honest with you, because I'm so broken. My only hope is she's looking at Jesus, and I'm looking at Jesus, which means. Mm -hmm. As we draw near to Him, all things will be healed, and all thing and and we will be we will come together, always in that healing, and so that was the discernment process that I went through, and and it, and it turned out to be true. Uh, you'd have to have her on the show to to testify if I've been healed, but uh, I I claim <laughs> that the Lord healed me of a lot. So it's beautiful. Yeah, we should have it's Stephanie, right, Stephanie. Your beautiful yeah. wife. We should have her yeah. on the show. She's a better speaker than I am. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, there's a couple things you said that I wanted to pick up on because they're so interesting and important. So you were talking earlier back to the kind of two types of people and the way that the different spirits, um, you know, the Holy Spirit versus like the devil, basically will interplay with those people. And you're talking about the person in mortal sin going from serious mm -hmm. sin to serious sin. So they're living a life of, you know, really outside of grace. Um, in this unrepentant sin. Yeah. And they're justifying it typically. And they're saying, I like the way I live. I feel good most of the time. And then they get their conscience pricked. And then they, you know, they maybe hate, you know, Christianity or the Catholic Church because they're like, you're putting these rules on me that are hurting me and you're making me feel shame. There is this big thing in our culture, which is you make me feel bad. And that is a bad reflection on you. You're the bad guy because you have these morals that are making me feel bad. Just live and let live. Let me be free. 
and in their like supposed yeah. freedom bubble. And I'm talking about people who are, you know, in, yeah, maybe living up, living together before marriage, um, you know, the kind of LGBT world of like actively living in ways that are not in order with God's plan, you know, adultery, you mentioned porn, all of these things, or just, you know, super selfish, materialistic, this is all about me. I just want to crush it and I'm not going to care about relationships, that kind of stuff. Um, and there's probably more we could come up with, right? But what would yeah. you say is the way if somebody knows someone like that that they love, and they'll just move, go there, yeah. how can they, you know, speak the truth, but they also don't want the person to shut them out? Like they're, that person's shutting out the good spirit's voice, right? Um, but they, so they want to be in that person's yeah. life. Any recommendations for that? So I would say love built a bridge over which truth can pass. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean, I, I don't mean, I don't mean like love, like kind, like shallow kindness. What I mean is m the guy who witnessed to me first that I thought was hitting on me, he finished his work every day. And, and then he, he would come and then ask to help me do my work. The first day I said I had to do bathrooms and I was whining about it, he said, I'll do them for you. And you know, I never did bathroom duty at that restaurant because he always took it up for me. So I'm, you, you have to love people in, in a way that I would call extraordinary. So it's not using turn signals. It's not smiling. It's not being polite. It's implicating yourself in their life. You know, Mark did that for me. I'll give you another example. Um, a woman named Phyllis. Uh, so I went to work for Focus on the Family, which Dr. James Dobson, you may know, you know, was a great man in the evangelical world taking up the same cause that you did, that you have, and uh, for the unborn. And, and uh, I was very anti-Catholic at the time because my Baptist folks who brought me to Jesus were very anti-Catholic. And then I had the wounds from my stepfather who fired a gun in our home and did all that, was Catholic. And so I was very anti-Catholic and I ran into this woman named Phyllis and, and I would do drive-bys with her and I would just say, you're going to hell, you know, you believe in, you know, you worship Mary and all this other junk. And she never, and so I was still, by the way, obviously I had a lot of sanctification to work out. Even after becoming a Christian, I was still, I was just really good at being a jerk, but I was, I was sincere in my beliefs. I was just working through all the junk. She never, uh, responded negatively to me always said well i'd love to talk with you about that and uh she but she was a lousy apologist interestingly enough for the faith but uh so then there was this point at which she was leaving focus on the family and i thought good you know you're a false christian you shouldn't even be here you should leave and somebody said there was a going away party and they they called me and said phyllis wants you to come and i'm like i'm not glad she's leaving so i sent somebody of higher rank and said you have to come and then i ended i entered this room there's like 60 people she was very well loved and for good reason <laughs> and there was five chairs high chairs and she put me in the first one and it was a chair like a barstool chair where your feet are up off the ground and then she proceeded to tell everyone in the room how grateful she was to me for um challenging her faith and for, uh, you know, making her dig deep and try to figure out answers like to what, because I was accusing her of things that weren't true, you know. And then, and then Lila, she took off my shoes and she washed my feet. No. And I'm, oh, I'm just going, who does this? Like, who treats someone who persecutes them and treats them poorly with love? And I realized in that moment, like she was a better person than me. She was a better Christian than me. Even though I thought she believed bad, you know, false things, it, it really made me, it really riled me. And I'm thinking, you know, here I am, this jerk saying these, you know, cruel things to her all the time. And then she puts me up in front of everybody as somebody who's good, you know, and washes my feet. And so, I always tell people love built a bridge over which truth can pass. She wasn't even good at conveying truth, but she was good at loving and everybody can love. Everybody can love. Everybody can give themselves to other people 
Everybody can commit acts of self-sacrifice. Everybody can finish their work early and help somebody else. Everybody can go help somebody move. Everyone can grieve with those who grieve. You know, everyone can, you know, help that, you know, young mother with a new baby who's sick and bring food and every, you know, so love. So she loved me. Mark loved me. All these people loved me with time, with service, with patience. And what it did is it, 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 it enabled me to first hear the message of Jesus and become a Christian in the first place, and then be open to maybe the Catholic Church isn't this crazy institution of people with all these weird beliefs, because Phyllis is something special. You know, so that's the, this this secret. Now, if you go to the New Testament and you said to Saint, if you ask Saint Paul the same question, you know what he would say? He would say, "Shut your mouth and live your faith." And then elsewhere, it says, "Be ready to bear witness to what he's done for you." The reason for the hope that lies within you is what the scripture passage says. So we get both of these pieces of advice from Paul to the believer, to the unbeliever. Be quiet and live and be ready, which is different than a lot of people come to me and say, what's the bumper sticker? They want the zinger that'll make people come to Jesus or get their life right. And I, I always say there's no bumper sticker answer to this problem. It mm -hmm. took me 20 years to come to fall on my face and say, I'm done being the God of my universe. You know, you, you are it, you got to help me. And it, and it, and it came through love and truth, but in that order is, is really the most important advice I think that I could give. That's so beautiful. It's such a, a good reminder too, because I think about my life and the people that have made the biggest impact. I think anybody listening right now, we think about that. Like who are the people that really showed us love? And yeah. that's more compelling in the end than the arguments, than the debates, than the, certainly than the like fiery discourse that is so much of social media today and like politics and media. Right. Um, now, not to say those things don't have a role and they can't have value, but, you know, back to kind of the spirit that we possess with them. You know, I, I'm convicted of this regularly because of like social media and being on social media so much. But that desire, that temptation, I should say, uh, to, you know, say something clever. <laughs> Is it even clever? Yeah. But, you know, say usually not. But, you know, just to say something, you know, a random comment, an aside, you know, about some evil in the world or something crazy happening and that's basically entire sort of social media personalities and accounts are built on that kind of stuff. And, yeah. but it leaves you kind of feeling like, ugh, afterwards, um, it's been my experience. Yeah. And you wonder, is this persuading people? Now, some people it does persuade because I think th there's conscience pricking that happens that does need to happen for a lot of people or just like eye opening stuff. But do you have any thoughts about our disposition as Christians in, you know, yes, in a world that needs the truth and there's people that need to be convicted of the truth and maybe we feel called to speak it but to still possess that love so much of love is an action right but maybe your action is just speaking the truth and so how do you how do you add the love in there without being like like yeah. you know uh, sugar sweet right like oh every you know just just be, be the nice girl be the nice guy like is that really what you're supposed to be doing either well, you just described why I'm not on social media and haven't been for three <laughs> years. Like I told you, you're a wise man, my, Dan. <laughs> well, well, I'm just no, I know what it is. Well, because you would rage tweet, a sinful man. Would you? Would you? <laughs> yeah, I. Well, I. You know. Yeah. I'm, why aren't you on I'm, social media? I, I'm a Jew. You know, I'm a Middle Easterner. We have uh, fiery temperaments. So I, you know, I just realized that I was not being charitable and and gave the password to to the folks here at the Avalanche who said, you can put stuff on my page, but I'm never going back. So I haven't even looked at it once since then. So because I had, you know, I just didn't treat people with the kind of love that I, that I know I'm capable of to the standards I want to have. But I know there are people, of course, as you say, who are, who are called people like you 
probably who are a little bit more measured in your temperament and can uh, <laughs> and can uh, kindly express you know what should be expressed but I'm going to leave my uh, my connections mostly to face to face that's that works mm -hmm. better for me any advice for people that are in that space? A lot of people listening spend a lot of people a lot of time on social media. Some of them are doing kind of the influencing thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think the the influencing thing is it, is good. I think that there are, <laughs> there are people who are doing it really well um, and need to get the message out. But I think the 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 sickness of the uh, social media culture is that is the fundamental assumption it, it it reinforces in us that we should say everything we think and everything we think is valid to say and mm -hmm. and we should just sort of throw up all over everyone all the time and it creates a really disordered kind of communication mm -hmm. where we're not listening we're not treating with each other with charity and uh and and we're just you know just throwing up on everybody so yeah i just i don't know how it fits with the, the admonition of St. James in the New Testament of, you know, be slow to speak. You know, uh, the, the social media teaches you to do the opposite, be quick to speak and uh, quick to anger, which is the opposite of what James, the Holy Spirit said through James. But so much of the New Testament, you know, when you, when you, when you ask the question of the Holy Spirit, you know, how is it that I'm supposed to uh, interact with other Christians. You know, a lot of us, a lot of my trad friends, and I'm, you know, I'm in that in that realm. Um, I'm in that corner. You know, we we say, well, we should just take a whip and turn over the tables like Jesus in the in the temple. And I want to say, well, that was a uniquely prophetic act, specifically prophesied in the Old Testament to the New, and that was given to him. But what does the Holy Spirit say to us? And how we're supposed to interact with people. And it says it says we're supposed to have patience and kindness and gentleness and we're supposed to you know be really aware of and circumspect of our own sins so we don't fall into it and we're you know so and and by the way he says you know let my house be a house of prayer i want to say why don't you focus on the prayer thing not the whip thing because nowhere are you are you called to had to do the whip thing let's focus on the house of prayer thing let's focus on uh, showing people the love of Jesus. One of the reasons I love uh, the Chosen series, mm -hmm. because Jonathan Rumi is is so gifted at communicating compassion and mercy mm -hmm. without compromising truth. You know, I, 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 he's just masterful at that. I mean, of course, the writers and the the producers and all of that that surround that show. And I think that's why in the New Testament, no, why a prostitute would spend time with him mm -hmm. and why a tax collector would spend time with him everyone when he looked at everyone what they saw in his eyes was i, I know you and i know you're broken but but it's okay mm -hmm. it's okay i'm interested anyway let's hang out you know that's what they saw not you know oh you're you're gay and so you're bad or you're you know what's the list right you're a drug addict so you're bad or you're a you're a heterosexual who can't control, you know, his libido. So you're bad. You no, know, he looked at people, and and he they saw in his eyes, you know, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. You know, my peace I give you, my peace I leave you. Not as the world gives to you, do I give to you. You know, don't let your heart be troubled. Let's walk together. You know, that's that's you you live like that, and you admit. You you know I'll, I'll give you one more example. I know we're you're probably way over time, but I was I had to go to this hair shop to get my hair cut one time, and I and I was late. I couldn't do the normal appointment, and so I ended up at this place that I never go to. And the woman who cut my hair, half of her head was shaved, so you kind of know the symbolism of that. And so she asked me, "What do I do?" And I said, "I'm." I, I answer differently to different people. So I kind of thought I would like to talk with her. So I didn't say, well, I'm the president of, of a global Catholic news organization. I didn't say that. I said, I'm a writer. And, and, and then it was, was to invite conversation. She said, what do you write about? I said, Catholic mystical. Oh, I love mystical stuff. And so she starts talking. So she figured out pretty quick that I was not like opposed to, I wasn't judging her. And she had, she asked me, she said, um, 
it, it, I don't know why it's so emotional. She said, can I ask you a question? And I knew what she was going to ask. I don't know if the Lord revealed it to me or what. I said, I know what you're going to ask me. She says, what do you think I'm going to ask you? I said, you want to know what I think about people like you. And she, she looked shocked and she said, that's exactly what I was going to ask. And I said, can I answer a different question? I said, what, what is, what do I think about people like us? Hey. Like, so, so immediately I'm saying it's not, we're not different categories of humans here. I'm not better or worse than you. I said, I said, I want to answer the question, what do I think about people like us? And my, my answer is, we're all broken and in need of a savior. Every one of us, you know? And, and, and you know, there's, there's a thousand ways I could have answered that that would have wrecked her conception of, you know, a Christian God or a Christian. But the Lord blessed me with something that said to her, what I think would be something like if she met Jesus in the first century, what it would have felt like, which is, look, you know, nobody's judging you. That's not what this thing is about. You and I were both created for an eternal relationship of love with the creator of the universe. That is our purpose. And you and I both have screwed that up to greater or lesser degrees. So can we just walk together and talk about Jesus, talk about that and how he makes all things new? I mean, like who, who could turn that down? You know, so let's contrast that to Fred Phelps, right? God hates bags, signs, you know, it, like, and you tell me which one is rep represents Jesus. Mm -hmm. I know which one does. It's the one that says, you know, we're all broken. We all need a savior. So that's, that's that's how you reach people, I think, mm -hmm. in a in a culture that's you know telling lies to heterosexual people and homosexual people, and you know, the culture lies to all of us about who we are and who we're called to be, what's important, what we should care about, what we shouldn't, what we should hate, what we should love. It lies to all of us, and all of us to agree with those lies to a greater or lesser degree. Now, you and I hopefully have worked out most of that. And, you know, but who knows what, what still lingers underneath the surface that isn't perfectly, you know, oriented to God's will and ways. But uh, God be praised, if we look to Jesus, we know we have a really good, strong sense in the New Testament, so clear of how we should orient ourselves to those, to everyone in the world who, who yet knows him, doesn't know him yet, and, and but always from a place of, look, if, 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 if God, if, if it were about justice, I would be in hell for all of eternity. That's just the reality. I'm, so that means, so, so if somebody else is living, currently living a life where you would say, yeah, they're going to hell. Well, great. So now you're in an equal playing field. So if it's about justice, you're both deserve to be in hell for all of eternity, but it's not about justice. Scripture says we reach out beyond justice to mercy. You know, that's Jesus. It's about mercy. Yes, the price had to be paid. He had to pay it. But let's talk about that story together as broken people together, not as you're in this bad category and I'm in the better category. What a, what a crock, you know? How could I ever claim to be better than somebody? It just, it makes no sense to me. I've done, and maybe it's just because I've sinned so much. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe people sin a lot less and they look at other people and there's some sort of right judgment that they're better. I don't know how to get there from where I start. Well, I look at a lot of people, I meet people and they don't share my faith. They don't in some ways share a lot of my values or beliefs, but they're just like good people. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Like just they've got yeah. this like, you know, this Beautiful goodness people. and sincerity about yeah. them. And I think you're you're a better yeah. person than I am. Like I may have the faith and like the answers yeah. and I'm trying to live this life of, you know, virtue, da, 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 but it's like, you're just better than I am. Like, <laughs> um, so, you know, it is amazing. Like the, the way that the Lord gives his gift of virtue. And just because you have faith, like St. Paul says, doesn't mean you have love and you can have love and not right. have really entered fully into the faith yet. So, I mean, often they do come together, but yeah, it took me a long time to get past yeah, that external 
junk, that junk I grew up with. And my nickname at Focus on the Family was Nuke. I'm not proud of that. That's short for nuclear, you know. <laughs> but yeah. So. Did you ever get written up over there? <laughs> I got the Scrooge Award without trying <laughs> uh, every year. So yeah, I did get, no, I did. I got in trouble too. I did. <laughs> the Lord used that place to really purify me in a lot of ways. Heal me. I went through a lot of healing process of mm. getting rid of all that anger and, and that brokenness. Mm. Dan, uh, there's one more question. I know we're running out of time, but this has been so awesome. Yeah. I really wanted to ask you about desire because I think that plays into discernment and decision making so much. Like what we do with desires that we have. Like I have this desire to, yeah. you know, marry a certain kind of person or I have this desire to do this yeah. certain kind of work. You know, I have this like image or this like idea of, you know, being, you know, like one fourth of all kids today, uh, Gen Zers want to be YouTubers, right? As an example, I think it's alpha yeah. kids, generation alpha, yeah. one degree, one uh, yeah. uh, level younger than Gen Z, one fourth of them want to be YouTubers. Like that to them is the desirable life to live in the future, more than like an actor or a banker yeah. or, you know, a businessman or whatever. Um, so what do we do with, how do we discern which desires are from God versus a bad desire or just a desire that is subpar to what God wants us to do? Yeah, it's a good question. I, and the answer is similar to, you know, discerning God's will back to the, the simplest, you know, first step, which is what is, who does God say that you are? Who does God say that you're called to be? You know, what is it that he wants you to, to, uh, what is the highest expression of, you know, your goodness, what he's designed in you? And you know, I love this passage in Philippians where it says, "Finally, brethren, whatever is whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure or lovely, gracious, if there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things." The word "dwell" can be translated "obsessed," you know, on these things. What you've learned and received and heard and me do, and the God of peace will be with you. So, so the prescription of Saint Paul is 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 obsess over what it means to be a godly person um, and then do and live in that godly way and then the god of peace which means the god who will speak to you in that peace and guide you in that peace will transform what you conceive of that you you aspire to be into what he desires for you to be that's that way it purifies all of your motives and clarifies all of that and and of course when anyone does that they find that peace that passes understanding and 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 it's compelling to them and they want to live the life more fully and i think that begins then to reveal to you who you're really called to be i mean i mm -hmm. you know i thought i was called to be i was really good at business <clears throat> my first book i published was a business book and it did very well uh, it, which is not easy to do um, in the secular uh, business and technology world. And I wrote it, and I, when I when it was done, I was like just completely unfulfilled. It was a dream. Mm -hmm. It was a goal. I had all these goals by the time I was 40, you know, run a trial, compete in a triathlon, get published, you know, uh, get a get another degree or whatever. And I accomplished a handful of those things and and realized in the end that they were, they were not necessarily bad things, but they weren't. They were sort of empty things that really didn't mean the most. But in the process, because I was in Scripture every day, because I'm in my faith every day, God was purifying my aspirations, mm -hmm. my desires. And then through achieving some of them and then realizing how shallow and empty they were, including making a lot of money, um, I, I realized that that wasn't what my calling was, and my true calling was in a different direction. So I think... It's just about spending time with Jesus and letting him speak to you and letting, uh, bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, learning the teachings of the church, of the faith, living those, and then his, his will emerges in you and you discover, you know, that even if you're an introverted, melancholic, hyper-introverted, melancholic, maybe you're supposed to speak to thousands and thousands of people um, and get and do the very thing that makes you uncomfortable, but that bears all this fruit. But the only way to do that is by walking with Jesus. I mean, I, there's no like shortcut. It's beautiful. Yeah, and I think that part of what you're describing too in that intimacy of prayer with the Lord is also vulnerability, you know, being willing to be vulnerable. And if you have desires, 
don't don't just stifle them and bury them, but be honest about them with the Lord and then say, Lord, what do you think? Like, purify this, reveal what you want for me here. But, you know, it's also uh, yeah. if you're sick with desire, but you're not even acknowledging that desire or you're running from it without being real, even if the desire, maybe it seems bad. You're like, I'm just struggling with this, you know? And that's where, like you said earlier, a good spiritual director, a good advisor is really powerful too, to help uh, navigate the, the desires. Exactly right. Good. All right. So such good stuff. This has been awesome, Dan. Um, where can people find your work? I mentioned spiritualdirection.com, but I know you've got all kinds of yeah. amazing work that you do yeah. through the Avila Institute. How can people find your work? Yeah, I mean, spiritualdirection.com is the portal into everything, really. Um, mm -hmm. Thousands of articles, videos, podcasts. The avila-institute.org, you know, graduate and personal enrichment studies, spiritual formation. And we, we were also forming priests and for 85 dioceses, which is really a great blessing for us. And then uh, Apostoli VA community, if, if anyone's interested um, in the uh, living a contemplative life that we, we live. But uh, anyway, thank you so much, uh, Lila, for all your good work. I just want to say really grateful you're out there and uh, doing doing so much to bring uh, the faith into difficult corners of the internet. I've watched you in some pretty <laughs> fascinating interviews with some fascinating people and then in your own outlets. Um, so thank you for all the good and, and be assured of my prayers and please pray for me. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for saying yes to God and uh, putting yourself out there as an introvert and writing even when you don't want to write because it has blessed me so much and I know it's blessed countless other people and is going to bless many, many more. So thank you. God be praised. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast and the interview with Dan Burke. I really enjoyed that conversation with him and brought tears to my eyes a couple times, but it was also very encouraging to remember how the Lord works with us, that he is always working with us and that there are rules and guidelines for how we can discern his voice and continue to run after him. So I hope you enjoyed it. As always, do not forget to subscribe to the Lila Rose podcast. It truly helps the podcast reach more people. If you're watching on YouTube right now, most of the people who watch the videos on YouTube are not subscribed yet to the show. So hit that notification bell or hit that subscribe button and then hit the notification bell so you are subscribed and you do not miss another episode of the show. And please, don't forget about the locals community. This is brand new. We've got almost, I think, 500 people at the community now. We're trying to grow this. This is how we're going to have an independent free speech platform in case we get bumped from YouTube or in case something happens on our social media accounts where we know we can continue to connect and stay connected to you. So locals.com, the link is in the bio and it's the Lila Rose page on Locals. And we'd love your support. You can become a monthly supporter of the show and that will help us create and produce more podcasts and more great content for you guys. So check it out at the link in the bio. And I hope to see you over at Locals. As always, have a great rest of your day and we'll see you next time.